Income tax 2022-2023 maker's depreciation. Which property class applies under GDS, otherwise known as general depreciation system? Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from publication 946, How to Depreciate Property Tax Year 2022. You can find it at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Look, support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Looking at the income tax formula, noting we're on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, although just an outline of scaffolding, other forms and schedules rolling in, flowing into these line items. One of those, the Schedule C, which has business income minus business expenses, gives us the net business income. The Schedule C net income, in essence, flowing into line one income of our income tax formula. Page one of the form 1040, remembering the Schedule C flows into the Schedule 1, which flows into the first page of the form 1040, line number eight. The Schedule C is called the profit or loss from business income statement format, having income minus expenses. We're focused on the expenses here and more particularly, more precisely, on the depreciation expense, remembering that as you have property, plant, and equipment, even if you're on a cash-based system, you're going to have to do an accrual concept thing, put it on the books as an asset in essence, allocating the cost then over its useful life from an accounting standpoint. That would be in order to try to match the use of the item and the expense related to it, reflecting that usage in the same period that the income was generated from the usage of the item. Although, of course, the tax code is a little bit strange because the tax code sometimes follows accounting concepts, but then deviates from them, possibly using accelerated depreciation methods, which still kind of line up with accounting concepts, but possibly also using things like a 179 deduction or special depreciation that are more economically driven and politically driven items. Our goal as taxpayers is to try to usually get the deduction as early as possible. So we want the biggest deduction as early as possible with the cost of equipment. That would mean it's a big purchase item. We would like to deduct it sooner rather than later if the tax code lets us do that. That said, we touched on the property classes last time. We're gonna review that and then go into them in more detail. So, which property class applies under GDS? GDS is the general depreciation system under makers. These are some of the most common kind of classifications. So the following is a list of the nine property classifications under GDS and examples of the types of property included in each class. Now remember, when we look at the tax code, we are more restricted in terms of having to categorize whatever type of equipment we have in particular classes. The tax code needing to be more restrictive because we have an incentive on the tax side of things to try to take the depreciation sooner, which is different than the incentives we have on the financial statement side of things, which for large companies might be governed by generally accepted accounting principles. Okay, so these property classes are also listed under column A in section B of part three of form 4562. So you can go there when you're looking up and you're referencing things as you're adding something as a piece of equipment. The thought process usually looks something like this. You say, hey, is this something, usually a large dollar item, something that I should be expensing or should I put it on the books as an asset? If you're gonna put it on the books as an asset and then need to depreciate it, then the question is, well, what's the classification that I'm going to be using to re be recording the depreciation? There could be a difference 
between the book basis you're going to be using and the tax basis that you're going to be using. And the tax software often has the capacity to do that difference, to do both of those calculations. So small businesses then are also faced with the question of, do I want a different depreciation structure for book versus taxes, which you may want because the book depreciation is more accurate for the purpose of bookkeeping. Whereas the tax depreciation, your objective of course, is to take as much depreciation as possible, as soon as possible, usually in order to maximize your tax benefits. So you might wanna discuss that, the pros and cons with a tax professional related to that. In any case, for details, information on property classes, see Appendix B, Table of Class Lives and Recovery Periods in this publication. Okay, so common classifications. We've got the uh, three-year property, the three-year property tractor units for over-the-road use, any racehorse over two years old when placed in service. Obviously, racehorses were probably a bigger thing back in the day, but I'd still like to have a, a racehorse that I can bring on out to the old track. Any case, any other horse other than a racehorse over 12 years old when placed in service and qualified rent to own property defined later. Then we've got the five-year property, another very popular category. We've got, of course, the automobiles, taxis, buses, and trucks, which are quite popular depreciable type of items, which might have their own special kind of rules related to depreciation we talk about in a future time. Any qualified technological equipment, Office machinery, such as typewriters, calculators, copiers, another quite common categorization. Any property used to research and experimentation. Breeding cattle and dairy cattle. Uh, appliances, carpets, furniture, etc. used in a residential rental real estate activity. Also, you would think fairly common categorization. Certain geothermal, solar, and wind energy property and any machinery equipment other than any grain bin, cotton gin, asset fence, or other land improvement used in a farming business and placed in service after 2017 in tax years ending after 2017. The farming situation, remember, have their own often kind of rules and, and regulations due to the, to, the, to the special area of farming. So if you deal with farming, then you might you can specialize in that area for example number uh, seven year property another common category where we have office uh, furniture and fixtures such as desks file cabinets safes very common uh, used agricultural machinery and equipment placed in service after 2017 grain bins cotton ginning assets and fences used in farming business railroad track any property that does not have a class life and has not been designated by law as being in any other category. Clearly, when we look at these categorizations, you might be thinking, well, this is this is a daunting task because there's no way the IRS can completely identify everything that some business might use, given the fact that businesses are all different and whatnot. So you're going to have to have this kind of catch all type of category uh, as they're trying to, to differentiate things. So if you don't find something that fits into a particular category, sometimes you might need to do more research on it, possibly going from the code itself to other uh, resources uh, to see to see where, where that would lead in terms of the proper categorization. So certain motorsports entertainment complex property and any natural gas gathering line placed in service after April 11, 2005. See natural gas gathering line and electric transmission property later. Then we've got the 10-year property. So uh, vessels, uh, barges, tugs, and uh, similar water transportation equipment, which for most people would be more of a specialized type of area. Notice we're getting into the longer depreciation uh, lives here with the 10-year property. Most of like the equipment stuff would fall un under these main categories. These are the, the, the three, five, and seven years are probably the most common, right? So now we're going out to 10 year. Again, vessels, barges, tugs, and then we've got any single purpose agricultural or heteroagricultural structure, uh, any tree or vine bearing fruits or nuts, and qualified small electric uh, meter and qualified smart electric grid system defined later placed in service on or after October 3rd, 2008. Somewhat more specialized categories there. Then we've got the 15 year property. So certain improvements made directly to land or added to it. 
So these are going to be the improvements to land 15 years somewhat. You might see that fairly, you know, could be fairly more common, such as shrubbery, fences, roads, sidewalks, and bridges, any retail motor fuels outlet defined later, such as convenience store, uh, any municipal uh, wastewater treatment plant. So that's a specialized thing there. Initial clear, uh, clearing and grading land improvements for gas utility property, electri electric uh, transmission property. It gets kind of messed up when I have it all one word on three lines there. Property that is section 1245 property used in the transmission of 69 or more kilovolts of electricity placed in service after April 11, 2005. So we're getting quite specific. If you fall into that category, you can see natural gas gathering line and electric transmission on property later. Any natural gas distribution line placed in service after April 11, 2005. Uh, and before January 1st, 2011, any telephone distribution plant and comparable equipment used for two-way exchange of voice and data communications, qualified improvement property defined later placed in service after 2017. Moving up to 20-year property now, 20-year property, farm building other than single purpose agricultural or heterocultural structures, uh, municipal sewers not classified as 25 year property and then we've got initial clearing and grading land improvements for electric utility transmission and distribution plants 25 year property this class is water utility property which is either of the following property that is an integral part of the gathering treatment or commercial distribution of water and that without regard to this provision would be 20 year property municipal sewer other than property placed in service under a binding contract in effect at all times since june 9th 1996 so highly specialized category there possibly not applying to a lot of people then we get into the items which uh, a lot of people might see a little bit more which is the residential rental property so this is any building or structure such as rental home including a mobile home if 80 percent of more of its gross rental income for the tax year is from dwelling units and so now you've got the rental property a dwelling unit is a house or apartment used to provide living accommodations in a building or structure it does not include a unit in a hotel motel or other establishment where more than half the units are used on a transient basis. So the residential uh, rental property is gonna be, of course, a more common kind of thing because people might own property if you're doing usually higher income tax returns. We're gonna distinguish them from the, the hotels and motels, uh, which sometimes can be somewhat of a gray area that you'd have to uh, parse out. So if you occupy any part of the building or structure for personal use, its gross rental income includes the fair rental value of the part you occupy. So then we end up with this situation where we could have structures that have multiple uses to them. And you would expect then that you would have to do some kind of allocation method. We might dive into that more. Obviously, rental property is its whole, it's a, its own animal, its own beast that we can dive into and possibly will in, in future courses or sections. Nine, non-residential real property. So non-residential. This is section 1250 property, such as an office building, store, or warehouse. So you might be renting it out or something like that, but it's not for residential or personal use but rather non-residential when i say personal use i mean renting it out for to like families versus non-residential the 1250 so this is section 1250 property such as office building store or warehouse that is neither residential rental property nor property with a class life of less than 27.5 years next we have the category of qualified rent to own property Qualified rent-to-own property is property held by a rent-to-own dealer for purposes of being subject to a rent-to-own contract. So now you've got the, the contract, which is a little bit different than normal. Usually you have a rental contract where the property is going to be going back to the, to the original person that's renting it. 
or you have a contract that you're purchasing something, possibly financing the purchase, but the loan is is different, you know, is different than the bank doesn't own the property. They have a financing to the property. Now you have a contract, which is a rent to own type of contract. So it is tangible personal property generally used in the home for personal use and includes computers and peripheral equipment, television, video uh, cassette recorders. That's kind of an old stereos, camcorders, appliances, furniture, washing machines and dryers, refrigerators and other similar consumer durable property. Consumer durable property does not include real property aircraft. So the real property would be the actual, you know, structure of the building aircraft, boats, motor vehicles, or trailers. My trailer is your trailer. So if some of the property you rent to others under a rent to own agreement is of a type that may be used by the renters for either personal or business purposes, you can still treat this property as qualified property as long as it does not represent a significant portion of your lease of your leasing property. However, if this dual use property does represent a significant portion of your leasing property, you must prove that this property is qualified rent to own property. So somewhat of an unusual kind of structure with the rent to own rent to own dealer. So you are a rent uh, to own dealer. If you meet all of the following requirements, you regularly enter into rent to own contracts defined below in the ordinary course of your business for the use of consumer property. A substantial portion of these contracts uh, end with the customer returning the property before making all the payments required to transfer ownership. The property is tangible personal property of a type generally used within the home for personal use. Rent to own contract. So this is any lease for the use of consumer property between rent to own dealer and a customer who is an individual which meets all the following requirements. Uh, is title rent to own agreement, lease agreement with ownership option or other similar language provides a beginning date and a maximum period of time not to exceed 165 weeks or 36 months from the beginning date for which the contract can be in effect, including renewals or options to extend provides for regular periodic weekly or monthly payments that can be either level or decreasing. If the payments are decreasing, no payment can be less than 40% of the largest payment provides the total payments that generally exceed the normal retail price of the property plus interest provides for total payments that do not exceed $10,000 for each item of property provides that the customer has no legal obligation to make all payments outlined in the contract and that at the end of each weekly or monthly payment period, the customer can either continue to use the property by making the next payment or return the property in good working order with no further obligations and no entitlement to a return of any prior payments. Provides the legal title to the property remains with the rent to own a dealer until the customer makes either all the required payments or the early purchase payment required under the contract to acquire legal title. And finally, provides that the customer has no right to sell, sublease, mortgage, pawn, pledge, or otherwise dispose of the property until all contract payments have been made. Okay, motor sports entertainment complex. Again, somewhat of an unusual category here. We've gone through kind of the main ones at this point. So this is a racing track facility permanently uh, situated on land that hosts one or more racing events for automobiles, trucks, and motor uh, motorcycles during the 36 month period after the first day of the month in which, uh, in which the facility is placed in service. So the events must be open to the public for the price of admission. Okay, admission $20. And then we've got the qualified smart electric grid system. Once again, probably not the category that most people are dealing with, more of a specialized categorization here. A qualified smart electric grid system means any smart grid property used as part of a system for electric distribution grid communications, monitoring, and management placed in service after October 3rd, 2008 by a taxpayer who's a, who is a supplier of electri electrical energy or a provider of electrical energy services. Smart grid property includes electronics and related equipment that is capable of 
sensing, collecting, and monitoring data of or from all portions of a utility's electric distribution grid, providing real-time two-way communications to monitor or to manage the grid, and providing real-time analysis of an event pr uh, prediction based on collected data that can be used to provide electric distribution system reliability, reliability quality, and performance. Now, again, obviously, these categories are getting more abstract now, and you can see one of the issues with the tax code that they have as they try to basically kind of force people to do the categories uh, for every basic item. So then the categorizations become quite complex. However, it does mean that, that you should be able to basically research the category of the item that you're looking for and properly find the category, which is what's going to happen in most cases so oftentimes the categories that come up most often you'll have an idea of the types of businesses you work with often you'll have an idea of the categories that are less common you should be able to research and and find the cat the proper the proper category so retail motor fuels outlet uh, re uh real property is a retail motor fuel outlet if it is used uh, to a substantial extent in the retail marketing of petroleum or petroleum products, whether or not it is used uh, to sell food or other convenience uh, items and meets any of the following three tests. It is not larger than 1,400 square feet. 50% or more of the gross revenue generated from the property are derived from petroleum sales. 50% or more of the floor space is property and devoted to petroleum marketing sales. A retail motor fuel outlet does not include any facility related to petroleum and natural gas uh, trunk pipelines. Okay, so qualified improvement property. This is one that may come up uh, more often than some of the more abstract kind of categories we've seen here. Generally, this is any improvement to an interior part of a building that is non-residential real property. And the improvement is section 1250 property. That's the property that's non-residential is, is made by you and is placed in service by you after 2017 and after the date the building was first placed in service by any person. However, a qualified improvement does not include any improvement for which the ex expend expenditure is attributable to any of the following. The uh, enlargement of the building, any uh, elevator or escalator, the internal structure fr structural framework of the building. Okay, so then we got the qualified smart electric meter. That once more, more of an abstract kind of system here, a category that might be not be as common to most people. So a qualified smart electric meter is any time based meter and related communication equipment, which is placed in service by a supplier of electric energy or a provider of electric energy services and which is capable of being used by you as part of a system that meets all of the following requirements. I won't go through all of the requirements for that one here because it's somewhat more abstract. We then have the natural gas gathering line and electric transmission property, also more of an unusual type of property. I'm not even going to go through the description because that's going to be more of an unusual property as well.